Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to our listeners. This is Lian Mack from Kudao Productions, and we are honored to have with us today as guest, Professor Jose Maria Sison, who has been in the news recently due to the attacks against him by the Duterte government. Professor Joma, in the past days, the anti-Joma season machine of the government has been churning out all kinds of propaganda against you. Some say it is because Duterte is rattled by the charges of human rights violations, corruption, and incompetence in the handling of the COVID pandemic, and that is why it is trying to model and divert the issues through political sarsuela, fake news, mudslinging, and uh, you are one of his favorite targets. Indeed, the anti-Joma season machinery of the Duterte regime is turning out a lot of propaganda in a futile attempt to deflect attention on the growing isolation and condemnation of Duterte for his grave crimes of extrajudicial killings and other human rights violations, corruption, mishandling of the COVID-19 pandemic, and aggravation of the economic crisis. The Duterte propagandists try to muddle and divert issues through various publicity stunts, fake news, and mudslinging, but they make a big mistake by presuming that they make the devil Duterte look like a saint by attacking and misrepresenting me. The problem is that I have always stood for the national and social liberation of the Filipino people, and I fight back whenever there is any kind of serious offense against me and other people. Um, the latest information is that the Duterte government, through the NTFLCAC, is orchestrating the call for your deportation back to the Philippines and the cancellation of your status as a recognized political refugee. Your supposed crime? You are uh, directing terrorism from the Netherlands. Uh, what do you say about this? Is your extradition to the Philippines possible? And how about the cancellation of your refugee status? It is true that Duterte himself, the security cluster of his cabinet, the so-called Anti-Terrorism Council, and the uh, National Task Force, ELCAC, are carrying out a campaign plan to call for my deportation to the Philippines and the cancellation of my status as a recognized political refugee, and hoping in vain that the Dutch government would be persuaded to deport me to the Philippines and violate Article 3 of the European Convention on Human Rights and the principle of non refoulement or non-return no? in the Refugee Convention. These prohibit my deportation to the Philippines or even to a third country. Yes. General Esperon forgets the fact when he and other rascals in the Arroyo regime instigated false charges of murder against me in 2007 alleging that I had directed this from the Netherlands. The Dutch government denied the request for my extradition and asserted the principle that the Dutch judicial system has the jurisdiction over such charges. Thus, I was investigated, prosecuted, and proven innocent before the Dutch courts up to the level of the appellate court in The Hague. These gangsters in power in the Philippines think that they can twist the law against their critics, even in the Netherlands. Everyone should recall that in 2009, I won my case before the European Court of Justice for the removal of my name from the EU terrorist list. It was proven before the court that since my arrest and imprisonment in 1977, mm -hmm. I have not been in any position to participate in any decision-making, administration, and operational leadership in the CPP and NPA. The current false charges of terrorism against me by the Duterte regime are all baseless and are obviously concocted for vile political purposes. Mm. There is no way that the Duterte regime can compel or persuade the Dutch government to extradite me to the Philippines or cancel my status as a recognized political refugee without violating the absolute protection of Article 3 of the European Convention on Human Rights and the principle of non refoulement in the Refugee Convention. It is not only this recent that the Duterte regime is making threats 
against my lawful stay in the Netherlands. It has been doing so in vain for several years already. Yeah, and they also say that the Netherlands should deport you because the European Union considers you as a terrorist. Uh, what, what do you say about this? I have already mentioned the well-known fact that I won my case for the removal of my name from the EU terrorist list in 2009. But the Saiwan agents of the Duterte regime keep on misleading the ill-informed with uh, fake information. They also wish to spread abroad the plague of red tagging promoted by Duterte's anti-terror act, which is actually a vicious instrument of state terrorism. The red tagging or communist baiting is a device for preparing the murder of anyone by the Duterte death squads. Um, Professor Joma, uh, let's now go to the question of peace negotiations between the NDFP and the GRP. Uh, with election fever on, Duterte's statement seemed to indicate that he is thinking of running as vice president in the next election. What if Duterte puts the peace negotiations back on the table? Will the NDFP go back to the negotiating table? He might do it to reinvent himself or gain what we call foggy points to bolster his candidacy. It is possible but not certain that the Duterte regime will approach the NDFP for peace negotiations if only to try uh, splitting the growing broad popular opposition to his brutal and corrupt regime. But there is no more time for him to make any kind of pretense that he can do better than all the crimes and offenses that he has committed against justice and peace in five years. I do not think that he can reinvent himself from all the crimes of treason, tyranny, mass murder, plunder, and swindling that he has committed. He has deliberately sought to kill the peace negotiations with Proclamation 360, terminating them, Proclamation 374, designating the CPP and NPA as terrorist organizations, Executive Order 70, creating the National Task Force ELCAC of 2018 and the Anti-Terror Act of 2020. He has gone so far as to torture and murder unarmed and aging NDFP peace consultants like uh, Randy Felix Malayo, Randa Lechanis, Julius Hiron, the Topasio couple, the Cabanatan um, uh, couple, and Reynaldo Bucala. Even if negotiations are to be conducted by the NDFP with a new administration of the GRP, which does not yet have a record of treachery and bloodlust, like the Duterte regime, such new administration must do away with all the obstacles that Duterte has made to prevent peace negotiations and kill the Hague Joint Declaration. And the Norwegian government, as third-party facilitator, must help to ensure that NDFP negotiators, consultants, and staff have the option to seek refuge abroad by way of reinforcing the safety and immunity guarantees. Um, yeah, to many, the GRP sounds like a broken record when it comes to localized peace talks. Why do you think the government never gets tired of bringing up the localized peace talks or negotiations when time and again the revolutionary forces in the Philippines have refused this. Is it about the money or the budget to be allotted for this? The GRP, especially its military, has been dishing out that will the propaganda that peace negotiations in a foreign neutral venue have taken so long that it is necessary to have localized peace negotiations. In fact, so-called localized peace negotiations, starting with the one staged by the National Unification Commission in 1992 to 1994, and coming down to the one staged by the uh, OPAP, eh? mm -hmm. the Office of, um, of uh, Presidential As Assistant on Peace Process uh, of General Galvez, have a far longer history than the formal GRP NDAP peace negotiations which started uh, only in 1995 and ended in 2017. The formal GRP and DFP peace negotiations resulted in so many major agreements, including the Comprehensive Agreement on Respect for Human Rights and International Humanitarian Law, and the drafting of most of the Comprehensive Agreement on Social and Economic Reforms. But the localized peace negotiations, so-called, 
have been one-sidedly staged by the GRP as operations of cyber, intelligence, surveillance, and pressuring and killing suspected revolutionaries. They have been used by the military for rocketeering, by making up lists of fake surrenderers, concocting fake projects of community development, and privately pocketing most of the appropriated public money. The OPAP is notorious for corruption and malversation of funds in the name of fake localized peace negotiations. Now, Galvez is of focus on helping Duterte loot the national treasury in the name of COVID-19. Yes, and uh, on the other hand, uh, why is the NDFP so insistent to have the peace negotiations outside of the Philippines? The NDFP has been insistent on having the peace negotiations in a neutral venue abroad because holding these in the Philippines make the NDFP negotiators, consultants, and staff vulnerable to enemy intelligence, surveillance, cyber, and physical attacks as in 1986, during and after the ceasefire talks in Manila. Even if the negotiations are held in a neutral venue in the countryside, they can be easily hampered or disrupted by elements or groups that do not want the peace negotiations. As I have earlier pointed out, even peace negotiations in a foreign neutral venue can be too risky and costly to the NDFP. When the GRP regime is as treacherous and vicious as the Duterte regime, NDFP peace consultants, resource persons, and staffers who return to the Philippines can be abducted and murdered. Thus, there is the need to reinforce the guarantees for their immunity and safety. They should be given the option to seek refuge abroad in case of any threat against them. Mm. Uh, but Kajoma, let's uh, go now to the case against the Duterte administration before the um, International Criminal Court. Do you think this will prosper? And uh, what should be done by the victims and the victims' families and their supporters, of course, to see that uh, to see to it that justice is served? At least the investigation under the International Criminal Court will put on record the extrajudicial killings perpetrated by Duterte and by his fellow butchers. Mm -hmm. And if and when the people and the patriotic and democratic forces kick Duterte out of power, they can deliver him to the uh, International Criminal Court for prosecution and trial. Under the auspices of the ICC, there is now a call for the victims, the families and supporters to submit testimonies and evidence on the extrajudicial killings. They should submit their te testimonies and evidence uh, with the assistance of the human rights defenders. The lawyers for the victims should also study how to go after the ill-gotten wealth of Duterte, which is stashed away abroad in the form of bank deposits and investments. If the ICC fails to have Duterte arrested, it is possible for the People's Court of the People's Revolutionary Government to have him arrested for trial. The people are openly clamoring for the People's Revolutionary Government and the People's Court system to go after the mass murderers, plunderers, and masterminds of criminal syndicates. Mm, uh, let me go back to the question on elections. What do you think are the chances of a Duterte, Duterte slate for president and vice president? And if this slate wins, will it not prevent the ICC or the International Criminal Court from trying Rodrigo Duterte? In clean and honest elections, the Duterte state is a sure loser because the Duterte regime is totally discredited by its crimes of treason, mm -hmm. mass murder, plunder, and gross negligence in the handling of the COVID-19 pandemic. The people are hit hard in the stomach by hunger as a result of the inflation of the prices of basic commodities. They hold Duterte responsible for the aggravation of the economic crisis. But Duterte has gained control over the military and police by corrupting them and making them criminal accomplices. He is also terrorizing the public school teachers under the Anti-Terror Act. Most important of all, five of the six commissioners of the Comelec are Duterte appointees and the Duterte dummy 
Dennis Uy, owns the TIM Corporation, which is the Philippine partner of Smartmatic. In brief, Duterte can manipulate the vote count as he did in the 2019 midterm elections. All the propaganda about Duterte having a high popularity rating by mercenary opinion survey firms, troll armies, the safe playing corporate media, paid pundits, and so on, is meant to make acceptable in advance the electoral fraud that Duterte is set to do. But he, like Marcos in 1986, can be ousted from power precisely because of cheating if there would be a combination of mass uprising and withdrawal of military support from Duterte. If done, then the armed revolutionary movement of the people will have extremely favorable conditions for advancing more rapidly than before. I have some information from relatives and friends in the reactionary armed forces and police that there are at least two anti-Duterte groups of officers who are determined to take action against Duterte if he rules beyond 2022 under any pretext. They detest and reject the crimes of treason, mass murder, and plunder that Duterte and his favorite generals have committed. Um, uh, this would be my final question, Professor. Uh, what are the chances, do you think, of the opposition? And how come the, uh, the one Sambayan is not taking flight? As I have already said, the opposition is sure of winning in clean and honest elections. But it must agree on a presidential candidate who is credibly a sure winner, who hits hard the Duterte criminal record, and who will then have the moral ascendancy to call for the ouster of the Dutertes for cheating in the 2022 elections. If the electoral opposition fails to remove Duterte from power, the, the broad masses of the people will have no recourse but to intensify their armed revolutionary struggle for national liberation and democracy. The people's hatred for Duterte and the rapidly worsening economic and political crisis of the semi-colonial and semi-feudal ruling system are exceedingly favorable for the new democratic revolution through people's war. Thank you very much, Kajoma, for giving this interview with us here at uh, Kudao Productions and uh, for sharing with us your views. As always, you are ready to take on your detractors. Would you like to say a few words to our viewers and listeners before we go? Uh, thank you, Kalayan, for interviewing me. I thank all of our listeners for being with us. I hope that this interview can serve to enlighten our Filipino compatriots and foreign friends and guide them to fight all the anti-national and anti-democratic attempts of the Duterte ruling clique mm -hmm. to perpetuate itself in power through state terrorism and electoral fraud and to escalate the conditions of exploitation and oppression for the benefit of imperialist powers and the local exploiting classes of big compradors, landlords, and bureaucrat capitalists. Mm -hmm. Down with the treasonous, tyrannical, murderous, and plundering Duterte regime, advance all forms of mass struggle for national liberation and democracy, Long live the Filipino people and the international solidarity of all peoples.